We have a really special event tonight, and it's good to see so many faces here. I'm glad to see so many people. Hello. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to Burning Books. Um, we are a new bookstore focusing on the kind of things you see on the wall and the kind of things you're going to hear about tonight. We're open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. We're closed on Monday and Tuesdays. So any day except Monday and Tuesday, 11 to 7, come on in. We've got books on any kind of freedom struggle that we can find. We'd love to talk with you, meet with you, host your events here, etc., etc. Um, we have a mailing list, so if you're interested in events like this, please get on our emailing list. It's at the back table. Nate's back there with it. He, uh, it looks like it's even going to be passed around. So um, sign up for it, get on there, and you'll get email announcements no more than one a week. Don't worry, we're not going to slam you with emails. You'll get email announcements just about events like this and maybe about new products we got out or something like that, but you're not going to get a ton of emails. Um, there are also books on the back table. Uh, including Splitting the Skies, biography, autobiography, and other books related to Attica and, and similar prison topics back there as well that we pulled off the shelves and put on the back table. Uh, we also have an audio CD. Uh, what's it called, Nate? Splitting the Sky, Life of Resistance. Splitting the Sky, Life of Resistance. So um, check it out. Check out the back table. Um, I just want to say that this is a really important event for me. This is, a, this is a big night for us as a store. We're glad to see so many people here. This is a rare opportunity that we have to hear from somebody with such deep life experiences, um, not just involved in, in such a huge, significant part of our radical history in this area, Attica Prison Uprising, but also involved in, a, continues to be thoroughly involved in freedom struggle of all kind, and is going to have a lot to say tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. I first met Splitting the Sky when I was doing uh, research for a book about Sam Melville, who was a man from Buffalo who did some bombings against the Vietnam War and went to New York City and uh, basically planted bombs in buildings that were housing government agencies and corporations that were invested in the war against Vietnam. He got arrested, he got sent to Attica, he was a key organizer there, and he got killed during the Attica prison uprising. I was looking for people who were in Attica who knew Sam Melville and could give a personal testimony, and I came across Mr. Splitting the Sky here. and. Um, it was, not only did he know Sam, but he had such a vivid personal memory and, and all these recollections of uh, personal experiences and, and just personality traits that really added a lot to my, to my study. And um, more than anything else, I really vividly remember what he was telling me about his personal experience that really sparked off Attica, um, where he and Sam were both there at the same time. And, uh, it really added a lot to my book, and ever since then I really wanted to have this opportunity to bring to Buffalo, especially on the 40th anniversary of the, the quelling of the Attica Uprising. Uh, so if you're not familiar, 40 years ago today, Attica, the, the uprising at Attica was violently put down. Uh, a bunch of people killed, both inmates and, and uh, guards. And I'm going to leave a lot of that to uh, Dr. Julia here. But um, I'd just like to say that this is kind of a big day for me, and a big day for us here in Buffalo. Attica is not just a part of our radical history, or our important history here in Buffalo, the freedom struggle, it's part of the global history. It's, a, it's such a significant event, it's the biggest uh, prison uprising in, in history. And, um, and it was just a half an hour from here, and it involved people who are still here, and still alive, still able to tell us what went down, and sort of help us plug into reconnecting with the freedom struggle today, because a lot of us seem to be disconnected with struggling for our own freedom, and so here we have an opportunity to really hear firsthand uh, from somebody who's really been involved. And I just like to um, just like to welcome Dr. Dewey as Fleming Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings. <clears throat> um, allow me to first. State from the, to state from the onset that I wish to dedicate this evening to my very friend, dear friend, my sister and the mother of my son, Nicosa, Nicosa Hill, Alicia, Alicia Jacobs. Would you please stand up, please? We lost our, we lost our son about a month ago. Uh, he died from an asthmatic condition, and so we're still grieving, and yet we, uh, 
yesterday I was able to get some closure. I wasn't able to make the, uh, to be able to fly out. Um, the last minute we might have found some money to do that, but I did not trust the fact that uh, I could possibly, I might not get across the border. He spent $1,600 for a round trip ticket, and then all of a sudden, uh, that would have only been to Toronto. <clears throat> I certainly know the U.S. is not allowing me to fly country to country. I'm certainly on their watch list, without question, and probably rightfully so. But I would not be able to travel. I, I never felt that I would be able to travel straight from Canada to here. So I figured if I went to Toronto and tried to you know, cross the border, it's, it's easier to get across through a bus than it is on the planes. But in any event, it still, it, it was so close and it was, so, it was such a close thing that it was not easy to get there. Um, it was easier to get here when I could get here uh, without such a cost and also to get here to do a commemoration for our son and to be there to pray at his, uh, his gravesite and to wish his spirit well, right? So there's, uh, and we, we tried to celebrate with the meal and, and to be happy because I think in the, in the First Nations way that we don't want to hold somebody here with pain and grief forever. That's what condolence ceremonies is. You grieve for a while and then you pray that that soul, that spirit and that beautiful human being that he was and others in this life will continue, will continue on in a good way because one day we'll all see each other again. So I, I want to dedicate this evening to my son, Nicosia Hill. Um, I'm going to jump into a lot of history here tonight. Exactly 30, 40 years ago today, the New York State Police entered Attica State Prison. Over 1,100 police, state troopers, as well as guards from their own homes came into the prison. They had every form of major assault weapon you could think, semi and fully automatic weapons. When they came in, <clears throat> there was an ultimatum given. There was a helicopter that flew up over the sky. And when that helicopter flew around the prison, it said, surrender the hostages, put your hands on your heads, and surrender to an officer. You will not be harmed. At the time they were saying this, they also dropped major canisters of CN4 gas which was banned by the Geneva Convention of 1906 as cruel and unusual chemical warfare against the Vietnamese and the Vietnam, the Vietnam War in the 1960s. They would use it, no longer use it after they used napalms and other forms of biological and chemical weapons in the Vietnam in Cambodia and Laos, and yet they took all of those weapons that were banned by, by a Geneva Accords as a violation of the rights against human beings as cruel and unusual forms of killing and warfare and they took it in and they put it into various armories and stored it in the states and one of those was the New York State Armory and they brought it in and they dropped five canisters of that gas in that yard that day. When the canisters hit the ground, hit the tops of the catwalks, it spread all over the place caused a major gas, gas and chemicals were eating people's eyes out. People couldn't see right for the rest of their lives. People had skins eaten up and their lungs eaten up with this gas. When they dropped those canisters, it sounded like bombs, and they went off. Five bombs. Uh, there were, at that point, we had 50 hostages, and the hostages that we were holding for five days trying to negotiate change with New York State's penal system, change for the 
cruel and inhumane conditions that people lived in, but most, most significant, we were fighting against the form of white racist minority regime, authoritarian regimes that had no basis of respect whatsoever for anybody who was an inmate inside these penitentiaries, inside the U.S. penal system. At that time, there was only 750,000 inmates across the board. Today, there are 2.4 million prisoners across the United States because the U.S. penal system has been privatized by people who have turned the prison industry a contemporary form of plantation and slave labor markets, sweatshops, that have turned it into a business. It is the U.S. penal system has become nothing less than an industrial business. It has become an industry. So much that Fortune 500 said <clears throat> that the highest growth market industry in North America for anybody looking to invest their monies in shares in the markets is the U.S. penal system. You want to get rich, invest in the U.S. penal system. So, and I'm just going right to the day right now, because that's where we're at. And I'm going to work all the way around this particular massacre that happened on that day. When those state troopers came in, they came in with rain, rain gear on them. It was raining that morning. Uh, we had been holding the hostages for five days trying to negotiate changes in the penal system. The beatings and the murders that were committed by the, by the guards at Attica with pure impunity and nobody, nobody ever questioned. These inmates who were murdered and beaten mercilessly, nobody was ever charged and or held accountable. So it was a very racist regime there were avowed members of neo-Nazi organizations, the John Birch Society, as well as members of the Ku Klux Klan. The prison, the warden, the, the warden of Attica, Vincent Mancusi, was a, was was thought to be the the uh, uh, Grand Imperial Wizard of the local Klan of the Klan in Attica. So what we were dealing with because most of the prisoners were black, Puerto Rican, native, and poor white. What we were thought to be by the prison administration was basically simply nothing but low life niggers. In fact, so much so that when they used to walk up and down in the galleries, they would never use, the law in the penitentiary was when you were lined up to go to chow, when you lined up to go for laundry changes, when you went anywhere inside a prison and you lined up, you could say absolutely nothing in line or be threatened. You'd be identified, step out of line. They had their sticks, which they called right there, their nigger sticks. If they identified you and pulled you out of line, you were beaten to death right in front of other inmates. And I saw two people get beaten to death, myself, bludgeoned to death. And they said, and grab them by the feet, and they pulled those inmates, and their heads were bashed and bleeding, faces broken, noses broken. They died before they hit the hospital. And they said, this is what we do to niggas that don't listen. Racism and the killing that came behind, these reckless killing, these merciless killings that came behind the abuse of authority, the abuse of human respect, the complete unacknowledgement of human rights. When they, when they, when they told you to move, they said there would be absolutely no communications between guards and inmates. When they told you to move, they said from here on in that when they bang that nigger stick against the wall one time, that means to mobilize. Two times means to move out. One time means to stop. So in other words, you were, you were basically put into a regimentation of complete control and fear by the President administration. 
And that was when things were good for the penal system. But it just so happens that many of us, myself, was a young man. I was only 19 years old. I was, old, I was actually just, just turning 19 years old when I went to Attica. I grew up in these streets over here. I was born in Buffalo, New York. I was born on the slummier sides of this city, the lower west side. My first, I was born in Potomac Avenue, right by the old oil fields over here. The rats were bigger than the cats. I grew up in the gang, gang wars. One of my brothers is sitting right in the back over there. I'm glad to see him today. We were in gang wars together. We fought together in the gangs. My brother Israel. Say hello, Israel. I'm seeing some of my brothers. I'm seeing my brother Alan Jameson back there. Hello, save us. Gotta go. Save us. So one of my brothers and his son. Was this, about this bit the last time I seen him, he's huge now. He's a big man. But I'm saying, they came into the yard. They dropped that gas. When they dropped that gas, they had these orange camera, they had these orange fluorescent uh, raincoats. They came through, <clears throat> they got on top of the catwalk. They got on top of the building. There's a thousand uh, the fully automatic weapons, semi-automatic weapons, every kind of assault weapon you can think of. I have brothers sitting here today right now. Stand up, Jerry. Stand up, Charlie. Chuck. Chuck. <laughs> Do I have any other brothers in here from the joint? From the prison? These brothers here, we've done time together. We're in Attica together. These brothers here know what that massacre is. Jerry, am I telling any, am I lying so far? Is there any inconsistencies or lies in what I'm saying so far? As a witness, this man did years and years and years in the penitentiary. So did Chuck. Unbelievable amount of times people did. People were doing life, life under the Rockefeller laws for a joint for smoking a marijuana. How many of you would be doing time doing life in this room right here today under the Rockefeller laws if you got caught? Well, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know there'd be a bunch of you. <laughs> I know there'd be a bunch of you, believe me. And we'd all go together at one time. <laughs> Sometimes you have to incorporate a certain amount of humor in order to lessen the intensity of the realities. Now I'm sharing a reality that only a few people in here know about, that are sitting here, they know it. And I'm talking to some of these young men, these young women that have never been in a joint, but they will certainly, they will certainly watch the take to a joint one day. We're all earmarked under this current administration. We're all earmarked were all earmarked and viewed as enemy combatants to the power of the state. And I'll get back to that. But when those state troopers got on the top of their buildings, that morning it was raining. There was a light rain. Before they came in, we saw them mobilizing, and we looked at each other. We said that morning, hello, brother. How, how you doing, man? Today's a good day to die. Today is a good day to die. I don't know if any good day, if any day is a good day to die, but it's a good day to accept the fact maybe you're going to die. Somebody's going to die. Now I have to say, I have to say maybe one for one of the first times, 40 years later, I was 19 years old. I was a very angry young man. I was taken away from my home. I was taken away from my mother at the age of five, six. My sister's sitting in the room here tonight, Michelle. She's right there. We were taken away in the foster homes. It was a forced assimilation policy. A single native woman could not raise a child without being taken, all her kids taken away. Every child my mother had was put into foster homes and some of my sisters ended up in foster homes my sisters were sexually abused in foster homes. I couldn't get there to protect them. Nobody could get there to protect them. I was taken to reform schools. 
I was taken to residential schools, I was sexually abused, and I started to become a very angry, hostile man because this was not the natural order of life. I was abused by priests and nuns in boarding schools. I was abused by people that worked in there, beaten. And the more I got abused, the more I fought back. All I knew in my life, my whole life, was abuse, beatings and control, and confinement in institutions. That's all I knew. The last thing my mother said to me, she come to see me when I was five years old. They took me and put me in the reform, or they put me in the well, child welfare office. She come in, there was a box of toys there. I had a Mattel machine gun, and I was just zipping away with it, having a good time. I was enjoying myself. I, I, I remember they grabbed me, they grabbed my sisters. Michelle over here was just a baby. Our father passed away when she was just a baby. Father died over here at the U.S. rubber plant. He and 10 other guys were sent inside the U.S. rubber plant to spray paint inside. All 10 of them, all 11 of them died the next day. The next morning they died because they never gave them safety issue precautions. Safety issue mask, gas mask. They all died. Now what I'm trying to establish here tonight is the psychology of an individual or individuals as we came along, what made us who we were? Why did we become angry? And what is that journey from going to anger and taking that anger to the extremes until a man can then or a woman can then see, I'm angry because of this and do an analysis of your own anger. <clears throat> and so my anger was, my mother looked at me and she said, she said, Johnny, she's crying. She said, Johnny, they're taking you away from me. And I'm still, in my mind, I'm going at it with that machine gun. And I just kept clocking it back and ready to go again at it. I was going. I was having a good time. But that machine gun was making me, I was venting with that machine gun. I was venting out. But I didn't want to hit, but I heard every word she said. Finally, she said, smack me in the face. And she said, Johnny, they're taking you away from me. She's crying. She says, I'll never see you again. She said, there's nothing I can do about it. She said, from here on in, you've got to be your own man. You can no longer be a kid. You've got to, you've got to stand on your own and look at the world around you and survive because I won't be there to protect you. I heard. I heard her loud and clear. From that moment, I watched the world around me as I went from foster home, as I went to reform school, as I went to boarding school, as I got beaten, as I got tortured, as I got abused. <clears throat> every man, every woman has got to come clean with what happened in your life to understand who you are. If you want to heal yourself, if you want to come in touch with yourself and to know yourself. So there's this particular energy, all those years, all those years of confinement, by the time I got to Attica, <clears throat> I was a very angry young man, but by this time I'm strong. I'm working out. I'm running 20 miles a day and working out in weights. I'm working out on the native. I'm on, I'm on the reservation, reservation bench, working out on weights. I try to stick up a store here in Buffalo out of pure desperation. I was sleeping on park benches, trying to warm myself up with a bottle of Southern, Southern Comfort. I had no where to go. Nine months of my life, I was free, and that was it. The only thing, I had no social training, I had no social backing, I had no social networking, I had nothing. I had to survive. I survived nine months in the street. They put me out on the street, man, with a, with a suit, writing $40 from the reform school. I had nothing. I had nothing. I, I couldn't even wash dishes. Well, I washed dishes maybe for a month, but that was about it. Anyways, what I'm saying is I had absolutely no understanding of what this world was about. So out of desperation, I stuck up a store or put my finger in my pocket and tried to stick up a store. And the lady looked at me and she started laughing at me because she knew I was posturing. And I didn't have anything on me. But in the meantime, she screamed out for her brothers, Luigi and I don't know, Joey or somebody. I'm not sure, but I know Luigi was one. A couple of Italian boys. 
They come running down the street. <clears throat> they come running. I started running out the store. I slipped and I damn near broke my back. So, uh, and next thing I know, the cops got me and they're taking me to Ten Delaware. And I'm on my journey to jail. But the thing was, and here's here's the point. When I was when I got a quarter point of attorney, they keep you inside of the jail and they let you sit there for months. They weigh you down because you're so bored, there's nothing to do. By that time, you're ready to take a compromise in the court. You're about ready to, you're about ready to give up and say, okay, uh, let's do some plea bargaining. Okay, so after the three months of being there, I, I agreed that I would go on probation. I never tried, I never had a, I never had a charge before, I never got time before. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go on probation. Uh, it's, just, it's the first time. I went before a judge thinking I was going to get probation and released. And all of a sudden, the judge just turned around and said to me, he said, you know something, mister? He said, savages like you belong in the cage. I'm giving you eight years. Get out of my courtroom. Take this guy away. And that's when I started my soldier. I got eight years for an attempted robbery. The only thing I got was a submarine sandwich. I would have got less time if I had sold a regular submarine. <laughs> I might even become president of the United States. Who knows? <laughs> I got eight years for a submarine sandwich. And I only took one bite. <laughs> so I'm telling you, this is my psychological makeup. And for the sake of time, I'm an angry man. Attica happens. There's a whole dynamic that happens in the process of us taking that prison. And in the process, the gate was locked. <clears throat> there were three guards that were inside this gate that was called Times Square. They had the keys. They refused to give us the keys so that we could access the rest of the prison when we seized the prison. So 60 of us started shaking them bars. Look at the stand up here, buddy. Look at the size of this guy here. <laughs> Guys this size, and I was not that big, but I was close, maybe half the size. <laughs> but 60 of us, angry and determined and feeling liberated when we decided <clears throat> black, white, native, Puerto Rican, we all, on the moment, on the moment that we were walking down the hall after they locked two guys up and said they weren't going to lock them up, we are walking down the hall, a Black Panther party, Sam Melville and myself walking down the hall asking, what'd you do with those guys? The Black Panther said, what'd you do with those brothers? You locked them up. And the captain says, well, I don't know, brothers, but uh, brothers? We're not your brother. The Sam, the Black, the, the uh, uh, Panther brothers smacks them. Sam Melville kicks in another guard in the ribs, and I yelled, turned around and said, take this place now. This is it. The riot. We seize it. Again, you gotta remember, we're functioning on anger. And anger's okay if it's controlled, but it can't eat you up. At that time, anger was eating me up. And I didn't know it. I didn't know what anger was doing to me. And yet, I still felt I had a right to do what I did under those circumstances where people were getting killed with impunity. And I was, I, I had nobody as far as I knew out there. <clears throat> I had nobody out there. I had nothing to lose. My whole life, I had nothing to lose. That's what I thought. So, and not only that, but of course I was also, when we seized it, not only was I em emboldened to fight and to take control, Take control of the prison, take control of your life. Because why? Because we had been so dominated and controlled, felt we had completely had no control of who we are individually. We're just property of the state of New York. So when we seize, but there's also a certain level of fear and apprehension. Human being has got to admit that when 1,500, 1,200 people bad start to riot, those gates were closed. Only 400 from each section. We had to get through there in order to become one body. So 60 of us are shaking these gates. 
the New York State Commission on Attica, the McKay Commission said the reason those gates fell is because there was a defective weld. Well, I'm here to tell you that's pure nonsense. That gates came down because we ripped it out of brick walls. We couldn't believe it when that wall came tumbling down, just like in Jericho. We ripped it out of the brick. We pulled it out with human power, and we did it on a united front. When that gate went down, when those gates came out and the bricks went down, we moved through. Now, for the first time ever said in public, I'm saying here tonight, I took a stick, I hit a guard in the head. He went down, he started bleeding, he had blood coming out of his mouth, but I wasn't the only one. Somebody shook past him and they beat him up and they stomped him and they tried to beat us back up and we were fighting other guards and there was a mass resistance going on. But I can say to you tonight this, in the midst of that, I looked at that guard, I looked at that guard, and for the first time, I no longer saw a shirt. All I saw was a human being bleeding. And I thought to myself, yeah, revolution is righteous, but yet in the meantime, anger and violence and warfare is not good. Under any pretext, it's not good. But self-defense of one's right to land property or individual rights, human rights. Self-defense is a necessity, I totally agree, and the, not, the right to national self-defense. I can't say that it's the guard I was accused of killing during the article right. I can't say for sure. I don't know. I don't know who he was. There was a bunch of them there. I don't know who it was, truly. But I would assume I hit somebody, hurt somebody. But I'm also, I'm also saying, there were many inmates killed with impunity that nobody ever found out how they died. So what we got is we got a clash of human beings, one trying to dominate the other in prison control. What we have is a lack of people understanding one another and coming to some consensus and common collectivity to work together with one another for the benefit of one another what we got is class division and class ideological warfare with one another. We have no respect, no respect for each other's right to exist as a human being. Free, free for the scourges of war. And yet, and yet, though today I may say, I, I, I remember, I remember reading, I, I started peeping into the guards, the Attica guards webpage and start reading what they were saying. Oh, they're so angry and hostile at us and they hate us and they blame everything on us, what happened to that. And yet then I read the testimony of three little girls that lost their daddy, the one I was accused of killing. And I think, you know what? Those three little girls are the same little girls that my sisters lost their daddy to a corporation. He was killed. Nobody ever said, nobody ever cared about him. They died, man, from corporate greed. Corporate in, you know, corporate in disregard, man, for the health of those people that died. And I said to myself, you know, well, you know what? There's some kids that are fatherless, and in a sense, I'm sorry if I contributed to your father's death. But in the meantime, you must understand, you must understand something. People were dying with impunity. People were being killed with impunity. The conditions were horrible. And you didn't have the right to draw a salary off of our suffering. And it's become an industry. It was the beginning of the prison industry and it's only grown and grown and grown and grown. And now, with the negotiations, the negotiations broke down. A certain amount of, uh, uh, many people were negotiating for what seemed to be reforms. I don't know. I, I'm not trying to make prison a better place for me to live. Prison is a cage. 
And I believe there's something bigger and better in the human condition. I believe if you look at our only own great people, if you look at our six nations, Iroquois people, and if you look at our traditional nations, and if you look at the models that we have for collective ownership of the land and collective ownership of the resources and collective ownership of the right to every human being to have a home, to have a good standard of living. Uh, many of us live in poverty, yes, that's true. But in the meantime, for the most part, there is a collective will amongst our people to try to help one another in our communities. And if we, I don't know, there may be some uh, jails on some reserves, as they're called. We like to call ours independent sovereign nations, self-determining nations. But we have our peacekeepers that try to keep the peace when the peace is broken within the community. But we don't send people to jail for life, or nor do we send them to a place to sit until we execute them. It doesn't happen that way. There is a better way. And this other way is alien to us. And so now we're just dealing with this dynamic. So that morning, as a result of that particular incident, and the fact that we held hostages for 50, 50 hostages for five days, but we negotiated very, very strategically for a better way while we were there, we were negotiating for changes in the penal system. We were negotiating for change. We had observers like William Kunstler and uh, many other peoples from the society, lawyers and writers. We even brought in the national media, CBC, CBS, NBC, ABC. All these media were allowed to come in and watch everything that was going until they decided to invade. Nelson Rockefeller said, send in the troops. Now I'm back to the 13th. They're all up on the roof. They're starting to fire thousands of rounds of bullets. When those bullets started going off, every fifth bullet was a tracer bullet. The gas, there was clouds of gas, and the only thing you could see while you were choking were those tracer bullets. Then all of a sudden you started hearing people screaming, oh my God. Oh, please stop shooting. Oh, they're screaming. And you turn around and you watch Sam Melville's chest being blown off while they're yelling, Melville, we're coming for you, you nigger lover. Fucker, you. They called out names. Elliot Barkley. Big black, we're going to kill your black ass. Nigger. Come on. You had your day. Well, today's our day. While they're doing it, thousands of rounds of bullets whizzing by our heads, gas choking us half to death. I ran out of a cloud of gas right into a gun on top of the catwalk, 30 feet above the ground. I ran right into the gun, and the gun, when he pulled, the clip went out halfway. It didn't fire. Another state trooper looked, they looked through their gas vest, smashed me across the face, and knocked me over that. They picked me up and they threw me over. They threw me over that catwalk, 30 feet down to the handball court. I broke my back, or I, I have three fractured discs because of that when I hit that handball court. I went out. I actually could see my spirit looking at my body and what else was going on around me. And then there was screaming. I could see the killing and the blood, and I came back in my body. It made people crawl on their hands and knees. They were taking people and taking them to the trenches that we dug out to urinate and defecate in. And they were putting people's hands behind their backs, execution style, throwing their faces right in all of this body waste, putting their faces in there and executing them behind the head, throwing guns, rifles up their anuses and blowing their balls out. They committed war crimes beyond belief. Un completely animalistic, inhumane war crimes were committed that day. They had everybody stripped naked. You can see the pictures. History is showing you the pictures. Everybody's holding their head. After a while, when they retook the prisons, nobody resisted. Nobody cut any guard's throat. They reported that we cut their throats. We castrated them. We took their testicles out. 
Seven days later, the official pathologist reports that said everybody had died in Attica died as a result of state bullets. 25,000 rounds of bullets in less than five minutes. 43 people murdered by the state of New York, including the state troopers, but the guards that went in their own homes and brought those weapons out and shot people with their own guns, totally, totally against even the commander of their own commanders. But the fact also was <clears throat> that these guards, <clears throat> they committed complete unjustified murder. It was a massacre that was the worst massacre in North American history since the massacre of the First Nations or Native peoples in North America as reported by the McKay Commission. Now I want to also tell you something else that you might not know. That same force, D squad of the state troopers that went in and killed 43 people and wounded 80 people and maimed it for life at Attica. Well, believe it or not, earlier that morning, they were on their way up. They were originally given the orders to go up to Highway 81. There was a major standoff going on between the Onondaga Indians, my Mohawk people, the Ganyangi Hoggers, from Canada and the U.S., both sides, were down 800 strong, and the Oneidas were armed, ready to defend Highway 81 at Onondaga to stop the bulldozing and the proposed expanding of the highway through sovereign Indian Mohawk ter uh, Onondaga territory, Iroquois territory. There was a defensive stand, those same guards, those same state troopers that went up to Attica, that came into Attica are the same ones that were headed for Onondaga, and then they were turned around and sent in to kill us. Many people told me afterwards, one fellow told me, a medicine man told me that a drum in the longhouse started playing an honor song by itself. And the people in there knew that the people that died in Attica died, gave their lives for Six Nations people to survive and live. Something happened that day. Very powerful. And it's not the last time it happened like that. It also happened in the same way at Kenyonge in 1974, Moss Lake. <clears throat> and that's where I met Alicia in 1974 at Moss Lake in Yonge. Because I went up there while I was on trial. I wasn't supposed to be up there, but I went up there and 400 of us over there making an armed stance in defense of that land. We defended that land because they stole that land and an incident came up and I just have the footnote. I have to footnote this because it's all unbelievably related. <coughs> that land <coughs> was stolen by the Rockefellers, the same one that ordered the massacre in Attica. That land was 400 acres of land up in Moss Lake. And Alan, it, it, it was that way, was it 400 acres? Do you remember up there in Moss Lake? It was 400. And there was a number of us. It was a Girl Scout camp, but they were no longer there. So we used those cabins, right? We got bunkered out up there when we took that land back. Now what happened was there was an incident where there was a shootout and some of these rednecks were shooting into the camp and nobody knew who was in the cars and there was return fire and it just so happened there was a nine-year-old girl in there. Now why would anybody take, you know, be shooting in a car with a nine-year-old girl into a camp? Because obviously going to shoot back. Young girl gets hurt, all of a sudden there's state troopers coming. Now we're all up there and we're on a red alert. Michelle was up there. Come up. She used to be, well, we used to drive up there, right, Michelle? She, we, she had an old car. It was, it was in the snow and we had the windshield wipers. We had to have like two strings going like this, right? And, you know, pulling it. Remember that? Remember that station wagon? Jeez. I mean, we didn't have we didn't, the vehicle we had. We had a, that's how we kept the snow off the windows. We had to keep pulling those ropes back and forth like that. <laughs> you remember that, Alicia? Yeah, that was, a, that was what we call a resmobile. Right? The res bomb. 
But we took it. <laughs> we, but we got there. I was told I wasn't even supposed to be up there. I wasn't supposed to have arms on me. But I again went up there. Still angry. Still angry, young man. Still a fighter. And ready to go to distance. But now I'm up there on the weekends. But it just so happens that weekend when that incident happened, it just so happens all of a sudden there's, there is a line of hundreds and hundreds of state troopers. Alan, I'm honored. Were you up there at that time? Did you? Were you up in up, up in Albany at all? There was hundreds of cars, state troopers' cars coming up, and it was just getting dusk, and that all those lights looked like a big serpent snake crawling up that hill, coming up way up to Moss Lake there, and people were all prepared, camouflaged in sheets. Holes, little trees and guns, camouflage on the side. No pointed hats. It wasn't the, the, we didn't have the pointed ones. We just had the ones that lay flat on the head. But when they came up strategically, they came right into our checkpoint. They came right into our space. And eventually people just said, surprise, boom, compromised. The state troopers just happened to be the same ones that went in and killed everybody in Attica. Now, it would have been easy to have a vendetta, but we showed diplomacy. We showed humanity. We never identified ourselves, of course, but we let them know you've been compromised. There's nothing you can do. The head of the state police said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. And he was part Mohawk and part Irish. And he called back to Hugh Carey, who succeeded Rockefeller, and he told Hugh Carey, he says, we have a situation here. We've been totally compromised, and if these guys want to, they could kill hundreds of us right now. We're dead. Hugh Carey said, you turn those vehicles around, get them out of there right now, because I don't want Ginyonge to become my Attica. Next, that's a victory. They left. They turned around and left. And then I remember talking with Louis Hall and others when he was alive. And, I, and Louis said, when they first decided that they were going to go in, when they held the council, right? They held the council. They held the, wars, the men's council. And when they held that council, <laughs> OK, see? <laughs> he wants to get down, too. <laughs> What's up, dog? <laughs> but when they held that council, they said that a lot of the people said, well, you know, this would be a really good time to go in and make the move to go up to Ginyonga. And a lot of guys said, no, no, it's not a good thing to go in, because look what they did to the brothers in Attica. They said, yeah, well, this is why they won't do it again. So that's why they decided to take Ginyonga. Well, after that incident, they got compromised. Mario Como, his lieutenant governor, came up and said, look, um, <clears throat> We'll trade you 7,000 acres of land for 50,000 acres of land further up near Danamora. And today, they trade it off, and today there's the seventh permanent settlement of the Ganyong and Hobart peoples up at Moss, up at, uh, 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 up at, uh, do you know what the name, the, 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 the territory they come up there? It's, uh, it's the latest Mohawk territory up at uh, Danamora, but there's another name for it. But in any event, Today, that was the first liberated territory in contemporary times, and I think the older Mohawk people would be, you know, with an applause on that. There's a lot of lessons. There's a lot of lessons of what happened. Okay, I went to trial. Um, at that point, I was basically, you know, I, I, I claim my innocence, and, and in a sense, I think we're all pretty much, you know, innocent of what we were charged of, in a sense. Everything was kind of blown up on one side of proportion anyways. On one side, people got charged, other people didn't get charged at that point. It took a long time before they brought up the second grand jury to indict the state troopers at Attica and the guards that went in and killed them without uh, being a part of the, uh, the original assault force. 
what a so-called legitimate assault force. Well, when they went in there, uh, we were on trial. We were on trial here in Buffalo, New York. I mean, some of you people sitting in here tonight were there at the trial. Spent a lot of time with us. Supporters, we had quite a few supporters, and I, I didn't really, I was pretty green, and I didn't really understand the, the nature of the political movements at that point, and you know, and the solidarity movements, and, and yet I learned as I went along. Of course, I was facing the electric chair in the beginning, plus 19 years for beating up another cop with my fist, assault. Now, I'm, I'm just saying that there was 60 other brothers that were charged with many, many, many things that totaled hundreds of thousands of years in jail. So there's 61 of us indicted, and not a single cop is indicted. We went about the trials, and then all of a sudden, now, did any of you attend those hearings yesterday up in here at, uh, what's, what's the name of the college? Is that UBC? Ch 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 University this one? Campus. It's what? University of Buffalo. University of Buffalo. And uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Bell, who was a prosecutor in a second grand jury to investigate the murders that were committed and the tortures, the tortures that were committed by the state troopers and the guards. And they had volumes of testimony about the atrocities that were committed. And I, I have copies of the amount of torture that they did. <clears throat> I, got, I got copies of all that, uh, all, all those testimonies that was given. Well, <clears throat> So this, uh, Malcolm Bell basically says, oh, Nelson Rockefeller was facing confirmation as the Vice President of the United States under Gerald Ford. Uh, there were Senate select committee hearings going on to confirm his confirmation, and many of the Democrats at that time were trying to nail him against the wall for the bloody shed in Attica. Well, what Nelson Rockefeller did was he contacted Gerald Lefcourt. Was it Lefcourt? Yeah, Gerald Lefcourt from the Manhattan District. Uh, uh, Lefkowitz. Lefkowitz of the Manhattan District Court, the second district in New York. And told him, who was overseeing the uh, second grand jury, told him to get all of the Attica prosecutors to suppress any evidence going into that second grand jury about the crimes committed by the state. Well, Malcolm Bell happened to be one of those guys that blew the whistle on it and said, I won't be a part of this. No, I'm here to, because he'd already investigated horrific tortures and murders that were committed by the state police and by the guards. And he basically said, he said to them, I won't do it. He wrote a 60 page report. He wrote a 60 page report. He gave it to the New York Times and the New York Times sat on that report for 60 days while I was on trial. But you know what? They refused to stop the trial and say, whoa, whoa, we got a problem here. Stop the trial. They waited until I was convicted by a jury in Buffalo. And after I got convicted, then, and I was sentenced, eventually sentenced on April the 5th to 20 years of life because New York State ruled the death penalty unconstitutional during that time in 1973. So now, where I could have went to the electric chair, and then sitting on death row with my brother Mumi Abu Jamal, and, and, and at that time Leonard Peltier, and uh, Marilyn Buck, and, and the Resistance Six, and many other people, the New York Three, where I could have been sitting there as a political, a major political prisoner in a prisoner of war on death row, I was now sentenced to 20 years to life. Well, that was even more dangerous because now you have a convicted quote-unquote cop killer going back to jail having to survive the venomous hatred that the police had for me. Jerry, did they hate me? Charlie, they Chuck, hate you, they still hate me. No, no. Huh? No, they did hate you, John. Well, they still hate me. <laughs> they hate what I stand for, and I stand for freedom, Amen. and I stand for justice, Amen. and I, pray, I stand for independence. people like us are in, are categorized as terrorists. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Hong Guiongwe, Mohawk, and Yonge Hogas. Number one on the terrorist list is CSIS and the FBI in North America. 
Why? Because we exercise self-determination and sovereignty. We exercise autonomy. That scares the living hell out of the whole corporate, multinational, transnational, military, industrial complex. It scares them. Because they will lose control. The more we exercise our sovereignty, autonomy, the more they lose their control. Domination, repression, the more they lose their power. The more we empower, the more they disempower. So they're going to brutally enforce their right to dominate and control us. That's the name of the game. Always was and always will be. That is always the common factor in resistance movements. That is where the struggle comes to a clash and eventually there's a standoff, eventually there's a fight, there's a clash, and there's conflict. Always was and always will. So here we are now over there uh, with this 20 years to life. Guards tried to kill me at least on seven occasions. I spent a lot of time in the box. I was beaten up numerous times. And yet I stood. And these brothers will tell you, I stood completely in defiance. A lot of brothers didn't even want to talk to me because they were afraid of being associated with me because they were afraid the guards were going to kill them. But I didn't care because I thought about my brother Leonard Pelcher over there sitting somewhere in a prison being moved around like an animal and beaten and assaulted and totally disrespected and threatened with death. And one day when he and Dallas Thundershield decided to escape from Lompoc prison, and they did expect, and poor Dallas Thundershield was so cold, literally gave him his coat when they were running, and it just so happens they had, according to a brother named Gear, I forget his first name, something Gear, but he said, he said that he, they had set him up, let them run away, but the guard, the specter that was there to kill Leonard Pelcher, shot down the thunder shell because he thought, because he had the coat that it was Leonard. You could believe they wanted to kill me. And they tried. And yet something, something kept me alive for something. For some reason, I'm still alive today. Because today I'm here to try and talk to you about the road to becoming a peace peacemaker. <clears throat> and being a peacemaker doesn't mean you deny, you don't fight back when somebody invades your peace. You have every right in the world to defend your peace. Your peace of this world. Your peace of the space you occupy. Nobody in the world has the right to, to violate your space. That's your complete, just every, every human being, you just sitting right there. Nobody can violate your sovereign. That's your speech. You control it. In this whole universe, you control it. Nobody has the right to enter it and unless you welcome them. And that was the gift that we're given from the mother. The gift of our rights when we sever the umbilical cord to become a complete sovereign individual within a universal whole. Nobody can violate that sacred right of yours. Nobody. That's yours. To defend it at all costs. And I learned that lesson when I was in prison. And I continue to show these people no fear. And, no, and believe me, I'm not saying there were times when I was afraid. I was afraid. I tell you. There were times I wondered when they were going to come and just take me out. But it was attempts, it didn't happen. But what happened then was after, after Malcolm Bell exposed this lie, the, came, the Bernard Commission came into being, they investigated it by Kerry asked them, uh, uh, Hugh Kerry asked them to investigate these charges. He investigated them. Five years later, Kerry said it's time to close the books on Attica, and therefore he recommended one that the state troopers and the guards be given a complete amnesty from any criminal prosecution. Well, okay, they won. That, but I'm telling you today, right there, footnote right there, right there, on that amnesty, that to today, there are many state troopers and guards who committed outright murder and torture that still need to be prosecuted. The books are closed for me. I'm sorry, the books are not closed for me. If I did five years 
for accidentally knocking somebody out and hurting somebody, maybe complicit in the death of that person. Somebody's going to answer for the murders of the brothers at Adam. I'm not happy with the amnesty. Then they dismissed the pending indictments against the rest of the Attica brothers. My case, they gave me an executive clemency. <clears throat> that executive clemency meant that I was eligible on the strength of a governor's recommendation to go to the parole board and to get parole. Now, I was a maybe a cocky little guy when I was younger, and I don't know, some people still say I am, but uh, I don't try to be cocky, I just try to be free. And if it sounds like I'm cocky, well then I'm cocky. <laughs> but what I'm saying, and Trump, Trump knows what I'm saying, because he reminded me of it today. He basically says, well, when I went to the parole board, I thought, wow, uh, there's no way they can deny me because this is just a formality. And uh, I mean, well, of course, all of a sudden there was Joe, what was that guy's name, Joe in Green Haven? Remember the, the black brother who was uh, the, the head of programs of uh, program that the head of the program, Joe Curry or something like that. Anyways, he gets me, pulls me out, says, John, we're pulling you out, but you, we, you gotta go. You get cigars, they bring me up, <clears throat> they load me into a car, they take me, two black guys come in from New York to drive me down to Fulton Halfway House, Fulton Prison, right? Was it Fulton? Fulton Halfway House. Huh? Fulton's in New York. Yeah, Fulton in the Bronx. Right, okay, so they take me to the Bronx, a halfway house, that's where I'm going to have my parole hearing. But as we're driving out, all of a sudden these two guys start whipping down the road, 120, 130 miles an hour, and before we knew it, there was somebody, a car full of guards, shooting at us. Trying to kill us. And that's why Joe, now forget his last name, said we got to get you out of here, because they were going to kill me. They weren't going to let me go on parole. The vendetta was that strong. Well, they didn't kill us, and we almost wiped out on that old dirt road getting out of there, out of Greenhaven, down to New York. We got to New York. <clears throat> it was um, before the parole commissioners. And he says, well, they start asking me all these questions. I said, look, man, I don't, I don't really want, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to answer all your questions, okay? What do you mean I'm not here? I says, look, you're either going to let me go or you're not going to let me go. I just got a pardon from the government, an executive committee. As far as I'm concerned, this is just a formality. Well, I went back to my cell, right? And the next morning, I got the slip. <laughs> and I got the slip that said, uh, two more years. <laughs> now, that was the first time in the history of New York that that ever happened, that a governor gave a pardon and then, then that, uh, or gave an executive clemency, and then the pro board, on the strength of his recommendation, hit me with two more years. I think that happened to you guys. Did that happen to you and uh, uh, McGibbon? Yeah. yeah, it yeah. happened to you and McGibbon, right? Yeah, for 38 months yeah. Around his right. It was in the same situation. <clears throat> Anyways, so they take me back to Sing Sing. I go to Sing Sing instead of Green Haven. So I'm there for two more years. And then after that, by this time, I've become known as the scapegoat of Attica. I was the only one convicted for the whole Attica rebellion, except for a few minor, uh, other minor charges of some smaller convictions. But I was given, I was, <clears throat> I, I went to the parole board. I was released uh, the second time. And uh, when I got out, um, <clears throat> I went through a series of things. I went through uh, my involvement in, with the American Indian Movement. Uh, I, I uh, started out, uh, I order, helped to organize the League of Indigenous Sovereign Nations, or LISTEN was the acronym. I started that organization. Uh, I uh, worked very heavily to stop the relocation of the, 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 the Navajo people, the Dene people from Big Mountain uh, in 1983. I mean, I think you were there, Ellen, uh, 83, before on that big, huge conference at the United Nations week down there, when we put that in. Disarmament week, there was 2,000 people we brought to the United Nations demanding an end to the rise of the...